When the water warms in spring, that, along with increasing daylight length, will collectively trigger an internal clock in male red ears, cueing them to begin fanning nests. In lakes where they've been introduced, colonies of these nests can be observed shallow near the bank around boat docks, as well as on offshore flats in up to eight feet of water. Resembling craters on the moon's surface, beds like these will remain active, and new colonies will develop through midsummer. I'm seeing oddball oddball beds all through here. Jump on it. There we go. There we go. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, whatever uh, whatever bites my string. This is a nice size bluegill. This is just a straight bluegill. Actually, you see it's got some of the red ear in it. That's kind of a hybrid with a bluegill. This is more bluegill looking than red ear sunfish looking. But he popped that little crappie tube. Pull it from one bed to the next, and eventually one's going to pick it up and take it. Yeah, there's fish down there. I see some moving. <laughs> What's hard to believe is how fast they can take that tube, put it in their mouth, and spit it out put it in their mouth and spit it out that quick. So you got to get on him. <laughs> He's got it too. Oh. <laughs> hey, I don't care who you are. This is a lot of fun. Yes, another dandy shell cracker. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm. Okay, the bait that I'm using, like I mentioned, is a Mr. Crappie tube, striking Mr. Crappie tube. And one of the things that I've noticed underwater when I'm filming this bait is I get a lot more action if I remove half of the legs. Get less legs and it, it, it undulates so nicely underwater, just like that. So there's a lot less to move. And the, the jig head I'm using is just a little bitty 64th ounce jig head. It's more like a size you'd use for ice fishing or something like that. Slide it all the way up like that. And then you poke the eye through just like that. move up here just a little bit and see what I can see. I mean there's probably 50 beds that are sitting here. I'm seeing a lot of smaller fish. I'm not seeing a lot of big ones on this spot. I'll try a fresh one over there. Fresh ones will come out and suck it in just like that. Ooh, that's a little nicer one. Ooh. Pretty good when they're actually pulling your drag. Oh yeah, that's a little nicer. That's more like it. That is a nice panfish and a nice tasty panfish, I might add. That red ear, red ear sunfish. But yeah, when they go to strike, they flare the gills. And I'll show you all that underwater. Okay, another one for the box. Yes, yes, yes. Sight fishing for panfish. I love it. But just like any other sight fishing, it's important to have the 
S11 sunglasses to have those good polarized glasses to be able to see these beds. It's so neat to look in the water, to see what's happening in the water. I mean, that's what Hook and Look is all about. There's a couple good ones right there, it looks like. He's chasing another fish away. He ought to jump right on this. <laughs> He's looking at it. He's looking. Ooh, that didn't take long. That didn't take long. It's a good one, too. <laughs> oh, man. I am just nothing but a kid when it comes to this stuff. He wants to get under the boat. Come on up here. Look at that. After fishing the shallow beds around the docks, Kim adjusts his focus offshore to search for deeper beds and larger fish. Just looking for some. And sometimes that's what it takes, especially out here deeper, is just to go along at the right depth and just fan cast until you get a bite or two. They'll tell you where they're at. Yeah, I'm seeing the beds right now. I'm going to set a buoy out. Yeah, there's beds all over right here. Now if there's fish on them, that's another thing. The deeper beds are hard to see, especially when there's a chop on the water. Oh man, now there's a, I'm seeing good ones down here. Oh yeah, I'm seeing a handful right there. I'm gonna get bit. And they're good ones. I'm seeing dandies bite. Ooh, look at them. They're, oh, they're the big ones. This is what we want, the big dark ones. I'm seeing tons of them. And they're coming up and looking in them. Ooh, oh, he had it. I'm getting excited. This was no doubt the mother load of shell crackers, but they were acting odd. You think they would be jumping all over my tube, but instead, in a hyperactive manner, they would just come up and flash at it. It was crazy, it was maddening, but fortunately, my cork would eventually go down. There we go, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a red ear. Ooh, yeah, ah, look at those big black beauties. Look how fat and chunky that beautiful shell cracker is. A classic shell cracker. Look, look at the nice bars and the color that's in that fish. And that beautiful, beautiful spot. That's actually an eye spot. The dark patch at the posterior of the shellcracker's gill plate is an eye spot, which they use as a method of protection and a false impression of dominance. When a red ear sunfish feels threatened, they will flare their gill plates displaying these eye spots, which creates the illusion that the fish is much larger and intimidating than it actually is. Ooh, that's scary. I'm gonna try running it up higher. I'm trying to find the magic depth to give them a bite. They like to come up for it. I, I do know that. And maybe I just need to stay off them a little bit like this. That one took it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's one of the good ones, I think. Shell crack, look at him pull. They're so broad. They're so broad, look at that beautiful fish. <laughs> what is that? Those are so nice, so, so nice. Eating a Mr. Crappie tube. This is a Mr. Shell Cracker tube. Very nice. Get out of there, man. Those little hooks get in there pretty good. Again, who doesn't like that? Nobody I know, nonetheless, 
This massive concentration of fish was perplexing, and I wanted answers as to why. Unlike the shallow beds, which were fanned on a firmer gravel bottom, these deeper nests on the silt bottom, when fanned, revealed mussel shells, which provide a harder substrate to support the eggs. Yeah, this is a softer bottom with uh, tara, sandgrass all around. But I mean, there's a ton of shell crackers So many visibly active shell crackers concentrated in a small area. I mean, this was a wad. Yet why were so many, for the most part, uninterested in biting my crappie tube? No doubt, these hyperactive fish were in a peculiar stage, visibly preoccupied and seemingly looking for love. I believe we're witnessing a pre-spawn ritual. And lack of a better way to describe, this commotion was mostly like some type of piscatorial foreplay as the males make an effort to pair up with a female. Right here you can see how they interbreed. There's a bluegill spawning right now with a shellcracker. That's interesting stuff. They hybridize. Upon a closer look, this male actually appears to be a hybrid himself. He's a much smaller size, and his general coloration is that of a bluegill. However, you can detect a slight red edge on the gill eye spot, and his vertical bars favor a male shellcracker. Another interesting occurrence I captured in the shallows was when I removed a shellcracker from the nest, and shortly thereafter, a hybrid, identical to the one we observed spawning, came in and began ravaging the eggs off the nest. Mother Nature at work. You can see that the big female doesn't have the red eye spot. What do you think of that? I mean, look at everything around me. It's just big shell crackers. As I swim along, it's all you see. I told you that was the mega rod, and it is. We hope you're learning from the one-of-a-kind underwater viewpoint of Hook and Look. 